saints, peace, love, and grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. I hope everybody is doing fantastic out there today. A quick review of what we studied in our last chapter, chapter 19, in our study on the book of Acts. So we can get some of the context of what's taking place. Now, Paul comes back from Ephesians. And we saw how Paul taught the Ephesians all about the Holy Spirit baptism. They had only been baptized by John's water baptism and they didn't have the Holy Ghost baptism because if you remember Apollos didn't know about the Holy Spirit baptism. Priscilla and Aquila if you remember were husband and wife. They had been kicked out of Rome because of the persecution that was happening at Rome and they traveled to Corinth where they met Paul. Well Paul, Priscilla and Aquila travel from Corinth over bypassing Ephesians and Paul left Priscilla and Aquila in, e in Ephesus while Paul journeyed onward towards the east. Now we see Priscilla and Aquila they took Apollos to the side and explained to him the Holy Spirit baptism for the body of Christ. Then Apollos left Corinth and he, he, he never taught the Ephesians about the Holy Spirit baptism. You see, it was towards the end of, of, of uh, Apollos' uh, uh, ministry where Priscilla and Aquila took him to the side. So he didn't have a chance to explain to the entire assembly there at Ephesus what this Holy Ghost baptism was all about. So now we see Paul coming back to Ephesus and he explains to the believers that were there about this Holy Ghost and so on. Now, the Holy Spirit baptism versus John's baptism is what we looked at in our last chapter. One being permanent versus the other one being temporary. And Paul performs extraordinary miracles, if you remember. Handkerchiefs and cloths and aprons were being taken from Paul and they would be sent long distances away and whoever came in contact with these items were suddenly healed of any disease that they may have. Also we saw the Ephesians burn over a million dollars worth of books and statues and all this paraphernalia, this occultic paraphernalia. And then we saw the seven sons of Siva. These were fake believers using the name of Jesus but not believing in Jesus. They were trying to be exorcists. And we saw how they got beat up by demons. They were sent out running and naked. And we also saw Demetrius, how he lost some of his business. He was losing money in his business because everyone was getting rid of their shrines and their idols and these little figurines and the little silver and gold necklaces and jewelry. And he started complaining about Paul because he was losing money. And then we saw this character called Diana. And she's also known as Artemis. She was called the, she's a fake goddess. And she was also known as the moon goddess, the mother of nature, the crescent moon. She having supposedly a virgin birth, which we know didn't happen. And she never got married. And also we saw that they were worshiping a meteorite, which they called the image of Jupiter cube worship and then we saw how the city official talks to the crowd to try to settle them down from all this commotion that was taking place and he, he, he gathers everybody in the theater and he talks about this uh, movement called The Way and it was attracting so much attention and it was causing businesses to lose profits so everybody came together for this meeting and you remember how Paul was kept outside so that it wouldn't stir up too much commotion. And then we begin our study in Acts chapter 20 in verse 1. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. Now during Paul's stay in Macedonia. He's going to write 2 Corinthians. The year is right around 55 AD. 
and it's going to extend all the way into 56 AD. So this chapter, chapter 20, contains right around a year's worth of activity. In verse number 2, And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece. Now, the word exor or exhortation here simply means advice. He gave them much advice. Paul had given them much advice and counseling. And while Paul's in Greece, he's also going to write the book of Romans. So far, Paul has written Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and now he's going to write the book of Romans. In verse number 3, And there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail into Syria, he proposed to return through Macedonia. And there accompanied him into Asia Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derb, and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus, and Trifemus. Now, those going before tarried for us at Trous. In verse 6, And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them to Trous in five days, where we abode seven days. Now, notice the word we here. This indicates that Luke is once again traveling with Paul. Remember, Luke wrote the book of Acts. In verse 7, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. So, what day is the first day of the week? Well, it's Sunday. The body of Christ would come together on the first day of the week, the same day that our Lord Jesus rose from the dead. Amen? Now, I'll remind you of the last video, the foolish Galatians were continuing to follow the laws, worshiping on the Sabbath. It was for the Jews in the kingdom program under the law and has absolutely nothing to do with the body of Christ. Paul never once told anyone in the body of Christ to worship on the Sabbath. In verse 8, and there were many lights in the upper room where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Now God's word is simply amazing. It keeps proving itself true over and over again. Now let me explain. There are some factions out there that teach this young boy, Eutychus, didn't really die. However, remember back in verse 6, the word we. When Luke writes the word we, that means he's with Paul. And Luke is a physician. He's a doctor. And of all people, Luke would be the person to know if someone was really dead or not. So Luke was here when this boy fell from the window. And of all people that would know if this boy was actually dead or had died, it would be the physician Luke. He was a medical doctor. And the young boy was raised from the dead only after Paul fell on him and embraced him. So we see Paul still possessing the ability to perform miracles here, which by the way, will decrease less and less over time as the transition from the kingdom to grace continues to take place in verse 10 and Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said trouble not yourselves for his life is in him and the young boy came back to life verse 11 when he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day. 
so he departed now remember they met on the first day of the week on Sunday and Paul preached all night into the next morning so now it's Monday morning in verse 12 and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted and we went before the ship and sailed unto Asos there intending to take in Paul for so had he appointed minding himself to go afoot so Paul decided to walk from Trous to Asos about 20 miles this is in the region of Mycia in verse 14 and when he met with us at Asos we took him in and came to Mytilene and we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios and the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Troglium and the next day we came to Miletus for Paul had determined to sail from Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia for he hasted if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost so Paul's trying to visit all the assemblies that he had founded on his way back to Jerusalem now one thing that's known about Paul is he always tried to get back every year back to Jerusalem to fulfill the feast days okay in verse 17 and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church so Paul ends up in Miletus he sends messengers to the body of Christ at Ephesus and he wants the elders to come to him okay Paul knew that if he went to Ephesus himself he most likely would have been killed or at least attacked now remember all the problems that Paul had in Ephesus in the last chapter the silversmith Demetrius wanted Paul arrested and it caused major commotion at the theater where the entire city had gathered because Paul exposed their false idols especially their false goddess Diana the huntress mother nature Artemis she goes by many other names even the Queen of Heaven in verse 18 and when they were come to him he said unto them ye know from the first day that I came into Asia after what manner I have been with you at all seasons serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews now here we see Paul addressing believers only the body of Christ he's not addressing any lost Jews here so his language style changes somewhat in verse 20 and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ and now behold I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem not knowing the things that shall befall me there save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me you see the Holy Spirit made it known to Paul that persecution was awaiting him in Jerusalem verse 24 but none of these things move me neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God and now behold I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men now what does Paul mean in verse 26 when he says I am pure from the blood of all men well Paul is quoting Old Testament scripture here specifically Ezekiel 33 in verse 4 then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning if the sword come and take him away his blood 
shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So when Paul says, I am pure from the blood of all men, he's saying he did everything our Lord Jesus commanded him to do, to preach the whole gospel of grace, to reveal the mystery to the Gentiles. Now Paul is saying, I fulfilled my mission, I've run my course, and if judgment comes, my hands are clean. I did everything I was supposed to do, so don't say I didn't warn you about this when these things come. It's important to remember that Paul thinks the rapture is about to happen, and Daniel's 70th week is about to take place. Paul's convinced here that the day of the Lord is about to happen at any, at any minute. And he's trying to warn them. In verse 27, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Now take note of the word departing here in verse 29. And if you have time in your studies, look up the word departing in Strong's. Actually look up the words departing, departure, and depart. In the book of Strong's and compare it to the phrase falling away which is the Greek word apostasia and you'll find in 2nd Thessalonians in chapter 2 and also in Acts chapter 21 21 21 which we'll be studying in our next video that the phrase falling away is the Greek word apostasia meaning apostasy which means a forsaking, as in when the Jews forsook the advice and commandments of Moses. They turned their backs on Moses and instead they worshipped idols. The Greek word apostasia that Paul uses in 2 Thessalonians does not mean a departure, as in the rapture. We already know that Paul used the word harpazo for the rapture. Also, the same word apostasia is used in our next chapter of study. Like I said, Acts 21, 21. <coughs> Excuse me. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. This word forsake here is the word apostasia saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. In 2 Thess 2, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, that day here, speaking of the second coming, that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In verse 3, first we see the exact same thing as what Jesus was talking about when he, when he taught, when he spoke in Matthew 24. He said, let no man deceive you. And we know what the first seal is all about in the book of Revelation. Then we see, except there come a falling away, the apostasy. This is the apostasia, 
Again, the beginning of Daniel's week. The deception that comes upon the entire world after we're gone at the rapture. Paul explains this in verse 11, 2 Thess 2.11. And for this cause, God shall send them, them on earth, strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. Again, this is the falling away, the apostasia. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And in the order of events, this apostasia, this falling away, this deception that causes the falling away, only happens after Daniel's week begins, which is only after the first seal is broken. Then Paul jumps to the middle of Daniel's week, and he says, And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Here's the abomination of desolation, the middle of the week. And Paul goes on to describe what's going to take place during that time. He sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So if Paul wanted to say the first, uh, that, that first the rapture has to happen, then the man of perdition takes place. He'd be skipping the first half of Daniel's week. He'd be skipping three seals. It wouldn't make any sense for Paul to do that. Also, it doesn't make any sense for Paul to use different words to describe the departing. Okay, what does he mean by departing? When, when he used several Greek words to describe words like departing and departure and depart and so on, why would Paul suddenly change the words that he'd been using all his life for the rapture to something else. It makes no sense. And the reason why it makes no sense is because Paul didn't do it to begin with. It's been an idea that's been drawn up in, in, by the traditions of men and denominations and so forth. They're trying to confuse you. Paul wouldn't suddenly use the word apostasia to explain a departure for no reason at all, especially when the phrase falling away is apostasia. Not even close to the Greek word for departure, which is anulusis. Two different words, two different meanings. The fact of the matter is, <coughs> excuse me, Paul used one word to describe the rapture. And we all know what that is. It's the word harpazo which was a mystery during Paul's time and is still a mystery today. The timing of the rapture will continue not to be known. It can happen at any time. And it must happen prior to the first seal. Then the falling away, the apostasia will take place. When God allows a grand deception to occur all over the earth, the word apostasia is used to explain that deception that causes the falling away. It's that apostasia, the apostasy. It's that simple. And those who teach that the falling away means departure, which somehow means the rapture, are ignorant of the Greek text. In fact, Paul says the opposite. He tells the Thessalonians that they didn't miss the rapture because there was no falling away. There was no apostasia taking place, a forsaking of the kingdom gospel that only returns once we're gone. You see, what Paul is saying in 2 Thessalonians 2 is, look guys, if you missed the rapture, you'd be seeing the apostasia, the falling away, the forsaking of the kingdom gospel that only comes after the rapture takes place and you'd be seeing this rise of the Antichrist. Plus, the man of sin hadn't arrived, which would take them to the middle of the week. So Paul reminds them in 2 Thess that they didn't miss the rapture because if they had missed it, they would have seen the first three seals, plus the Antichrist, the man of sin, the abomination, desolation, and so on. Paul is telling them that the rapture is still imminent because none 
of the prophecies concerning Daniel's 70th week and everything that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24 hadn't occurred. Paul's telling the Thessalonians to be comforted, not to worry, because the body of Christ is exempt from Daniel's 70th week. The anger and the wrath of the Lord is upon them, not us. In order for the kingdom gospel to restart, there has to be a completion of the gospel of grace, a closing of one dispensation and a restarting of another dispensation that God left off at the stoning of Stephen. In 2 Thessalonians 2.5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know that withhold, what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. The harpazo is that thing that's preventing the first seal of Daniel's week from being unsealed. We, the body of Christ, is that thing that withholdeth the unsealing of the first seal. We'll be studying this out a little bit more in depth in the next chapter and also perhaps in the future we can do a study on the book of Thessalonians just like we did on the book of Acts. Now continuing on our study on Acts 20 in verse 30 also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn, warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. The word sanctified means to be made holy, consecrated, set apart for a sacred service. When we're added to the body of Christ, we're set apart unto good works. The Holy Spirit works through us to perform good works. That's what Ephesians 2 is all about. Ephesians 2 verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is, a, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I, in verse 33, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. So we saw how Paul was a tent maker and he worked much of the time to help support his own expenses while traveling in the ministry. Verse 35, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. You know, a lot of people wonder what position they should be in when they pray. Well, here is an example of Paul kneeling down and praying. This is just one example. You can pray in any position. God's going to hear you regardless of what position you're in. In verse 37, And they all wept sore. They cried and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. And from here, Paul will end up in Jerusalem. He'll get arrested. Then he's going to be taken to Rome to face Caesar. Now, I'll remind you once again, at this point in our study on the book of Acts, we're in the year 56 AD, and Paul has written Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and also Romans. The next books that he's going to write are going to be the books that he writes in prison. These are known as the prison epistles. And we have Philemon, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, and Colossians. And he's going to write them in Rome from prison. And we're going to be covering those in the next chapters of our study 
it, there's still a lot of more information and topics that we need to cover so hang in there for the rest of the study on this wonderful book of Acts in conclusion to recap everything that we just studied today in this study Paul travels through Macedonia and Greece and he writes 2nd Corinthians and Romans and Paul's last visit in trials Paul spent some time uh, on an, an entire day on Sunday all through the night until the next morning and Paul teaches about the mystery and we saw how the young boy Eutychus falls out of a third story window and dies and is brought back to life by Paul and is witnessed by the physician Luke who happens to be the author of the book of Acts and then from Trous to Miletus Paul travels on foot Paul says goodbye to the church at the leaders in Ephesus and that brings us to the end of chapter 20 and peace love grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you Lord willing I'll see you on the next study for Acts chapter 21 